And we are live. Thanks for joining us, guys. My name is Dave. I will be the host for tonight's coffee talk, or today's, this morning's coffee talk. I think I need a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what it takes to be a movie set photographer with Chris Large. So uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Graham and Gary, who are sending up all our tech stuff and looking after all of that. Make sure that, that goes nice and smooth. And what's very cool about this is that we actually have a live audience, which is super fun. So we will do a uh, question and answers. If you guys have any questions, let me know. And if you are part of our live audience, we are doing, uh, I'll be monitoring the live chat as well to pose some questions, but enough of me yapping away here before we get going here. Uh, Chris Large, if you guys don't know his name, you definitely have seen his work. He's been a movie photographer on set for the last 20 years, photographing some of the biggest stars out there, Kevin Costner, Robert Duvall, uh, a whole bunch of people like that. So he's going to have some really cool insights into what to expect today. So before we go any further, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Looking you. forward to hearing all what you have to say about Great. working as a movie set photographer. So take it away and I'll be back and forth with questions. Uh, I got to tell you, this is very cool having a live <laughs> audience and streaming and everything else. I've done a number of talks uh, for Sony about mainly about mirrorless cameras. This one is very specific about my job, what I do, uh, how to how I got there and, and then going through uh, different examples. Uh, I'm a storyteller, but my stories are one frame at a time. And that's what a set photographer does. One frame at a time to tell a story. Now, I'm gonna be using notes because for those of you who know me, you know that I tend to ramble on and I go off on weird tangents quite easily. I got a lot of information to cover, so I'm gonna be referring to this. So I've been at this for actually 25 years. Uh, I've got 100 and some odd credits. Um, I've been all over the world, all on the studio's dime, which is kind of nice. How I got started, it was a hobby. I was in a whole other career, non-photo related. 
<clears throat> I started taking pictures of my kids, a lot of pictures. I had to justify the amount of money I was spending on film. So I started doing headshots and weddings and all the other sports pictures for kids, everything like that. One day out of the blue, I got a phone call that sort of altered my whole career path. I had, I had done movies before uh, as a sound mixer, so I knew, knew my way around set. I got a call from the producer saying, I need a photographer in Edmonton next week. My guy is sick, and I hear you're, you're a photographer now. And I said, whoa, whoa. I, I do weddings and pics of my, my kids. And he says, I don't care. You know your way around the set. Come up and just bluff your way through it for one day. Can you do that? And I said, yeah, sure. So I went up, did one day, and about a week later I got a call from the same production manager saying, I don't know what you did, kid, but they like your work. Can you come and do another day for us? The amount of money that they were offering compared to what I was making in my other job was really, uh, really tempting. So I said, sure. I did this for five years. A day here, a day there. Um, got some more equipment. Started meeting more people. I had a chance for um, sort of an early retirement from my other career. By that time, I had enough days, uh, and I'll get into that about joining the union a little bit later, but I had enough days to qualify. Uh, I had a portfolio. So I left left that job and I was a movie set photographer. When I started on set photography, all we could shoot were slides. Anybody shot transparencies here? You've got a half a step of latitude, a half a stop of latitude. Uh, you've got nothing higher than 400 ISO really that's, that's worthwhile. Um, if they're lighting by tungsten, then you either have to go to tungsten film, which looked horrible, or tungsten filters, which again was a pain. We all hated it, because most of us were shooting, for our own self, we were shooting color negative. Finally, the studios r relented and said, okay, you can shoot color negative, which meant we could go 400, 800 ISO and still have reasonable pictures. Um, it made our life a whole lot easier. And you had a film budget, uh, 10 rolls, a day perhaps, because every time you push the shutter, back then it was a dollar. So now it would be three dollars. And pixels are cheap, so that's what changed there. The other, other problem we had is cameras, uh, film cameras are noisy, because you have that mirror slapping. So we had to work around that and we had what was called a blimp. It's a metal box like that with the camera inside it, all padded with foam rubber, and you had one control and that was the shutter. If, if you wanted to change the lens or an aperture setting, you had to open the box up, physically change it, and it was a major pain. They were really heavy uh, and they weren't 100% quiet. They were mostly quiet, but if you got into some uh, death scene in the bedroom where he's taking his last breath and you're shooting, all of a sudden the actor looks out and says, get out of here, that's, that's disturbing me. So the next big revolution uh, after uh, going to color negative was mirrorless. All of a sudden there was cameras that were almost silent. The early mirrorless still made a little bit of noise. I spent a fair bit of time right here in this store in its other locations looking as digital cameras came out looking for one that would be completely silent that would still have the resolution that the studios needed because the earliest um, digital cameras were really really expensive and they were pretty crappy um, quality wise I, s I looked at a bunch of different different cameras finally uh, I saw the uh, RX 10 I believe, um, and it was almost quiet. I mean, it was the quietest one so far. It would be good enough for the action stuff I was doing outside. It had a, uh, a fairly fast lens, a, a uh, 24 to, to uh, 210 zoom, I think, on the early models, uh, and the files were really nice. 
so I bought one and I was using it. Somehow, word got to Anthony Jones, the Sony rep, uh, by someone at the camera store, that there was a pro shooter in town using a Sony camera on set. So this got his interest. I still remember, I got a call from him, uh, sort of a cold call, introducing himself and saying, we've just come out with a new camera. Uh, I'd like you to try it. It is 100% silent and, and the quality is really excellent. I didn't believe him, of course, because no, none of the cameras I've seen were totally silent. I was shooting in Heritage Park, Hell on Wheels, and Anthony came, came to set with the A7S uh, and the 70 to 200 uh, zoom on him. He gave it to me, took a few pictures, and I didn't think I was taking the picture because there was no nothing. So I reviewed, oh, geez, I did take some pictures. And then I realized what was going on with it, started shooting, and I was, I was sold. Uh, it, was, it was incredible quality. It was so quiet that, that nobody knew that I was shooting. You could shoot different angles, you know, with a viewfinder. Uh, it was a dream came, come true, totally. Shortly after that, they came out with the R, which I also got right away, with a 24 to 70 zoom, so I was set. Um, it got to the point where my Canon or Nikon cameras that I had at the time, I wasn't using them at all. So sold them while there was still a market for them and went totally mirrorless. As far as I know, I was probably the first full-time pro shooter that committed 100% to mirrorless, 100%. Now, there were some issues in the early days with banding, uh, but we found workarounds and, and, and the cameras uh, improved and, and that became less and less of a problem. Now, I've, shortly after that time, Sony approached me and asked me if I would join, uh, join the, uh, their ambassador program and do t workshops and talks and for, them, for them. And I was quite flattered when I saw some of the other shooters that, that had already joined. I was the first movie shooter that, that Sony had. Um, I told Sony right from the start that as long as I didn't find another camera that either made me more money, was easier to shoot, or better files, then I'm, I'm good. And they were fine with that, and that was 10 years ago. So I'm not going to get into specifics about, about Sony's versus Nikon versus Canon. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. You know, you shoot what you shoot. All the, all the major cameras now produce good files, and they all have their weaknesses, their strengths, advantages, and so on. The one nice thing about going to mirrorless for me was I'm, I'm on set for 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day. Carrying two blimps with, with heavy cameras in them got to be a little bit much. I was finding that by lunchtime, the monopod was coming out uh, just to give me a break from, from uh, carrying the cameras. The mirrorless were so nice to carry, so light. I can, I can have them on, two cameras on, all day long without any problem. So, shooting on set. I'm assuming that pretty much everybody here has got the basics of, of photography. I'm not going to go into aperture and exposures or anything else. I'm sure you guys are all pretty good on that. I'm going to talk about set protocols, procedures, the food order, the, the pecking order. Um, once you're on set, take your time to figure out the vibe of the show. You get a sense of pretty quick what's going on. You get to find out if, if you've got an actor with a major attitude, uh, if, if the cast is photo friendly, if the, if the ADs are photo friendly. Sometimes my first day on set, I, I don't shoot. I'll have a camera with me so they know who I am and I'll introduce myself, uh, but I won't necessarily shoot until I get a feel for things. A couple of people that you need to talk to is introduce yourself to the director, which is pretty important. The first AD, first assistant director, he's the man or woman that controls the set. He runs everything. The director there is for creative, 
The first AD is the mechanics of how it's all going to get done and the order that it's going to get done. You want him as your friend. The other person that you want as your friend is the boom operator. Because very often, you're in a crowded space and you're close to him and you have to work out with him. And what you have to work out is what he has to have and what you'd like to have as far as positioning. The boom man can be the biggest asset you ever had or he can be the biggest pain in the asset that you've ever had. All the boom men in Calgary that I work with, they're all friends. We talk about a setup before we do it. Um, you know, I'll say, you know, this, this works here for me and, and he'll say, well, that's, that's fine. Or he'll say, let's, let's switch positions if that still works. I'll ask him sometimes, before the actor starts to speak, or when, when the last line is out, can you give me six inches on the, on the boom? And most of them will try to do their best. If, if they can't, then Photoshop is your next best friend. Most shows, uh, especially the, the level that, that I shoot, I don't have to work, worry about any post-production. That's, that's not my job. It goes to the studio, it goes to photo departments, it's, it goes to people with master's degrees in, in Photoshop, you know, where I'm an elementary Photoshop. Uh, so I don't have to worry about it. I don't have a problem leaving a boom in the shot if that's the only way I'm gonna get the shot because they can, they'll take it out. Um, the other thing is you have to pick your battles and, and and you may be on a really tight set and you, you, there just isn't room for you. So what you do is you go to the first, AC, uh, first AD, assistant director, and say, you know, I'm, I'm really hooped here. This is an important shot. Can I get 30 seconds at the end of the scene to, to get a quick setup of the scene? If you haven't asked for that four or five times a day, if you ask for that once a week, like I do, generally speaking, you're gonna get it. And then the trick is to know everything that you need to know about how you want that shot to look. So you're not going on to set and maneuvering around and trying to figure out the angle, figuring out the exposure, figuring out what you want the actor to do. You already know that. So when I tell them that I want 30 seconds, I take 15 and then I'm out of there. You know, I'm fast and actors and, and when, when, you're, when your production time is a, three, four hundred, five hundred dollars per minute, you don't want to be holding up production. You want to get in there and out. And if they know you're fast, you know, you built up that relationship with them, you'll get your way most of the time, a, lo a lot of the time. Then the other thing I try to do is I try to get most of my coverage on the masters because what will happen, master shot, big wide from, from one of the main angles, I've got two cameras with zoom lenses on it. I can get a wide shot and a close-up all at the same time. I try to do that as much as I can. The worst thing you want to do, I'm going to set up a scene for you. The this is the camera shooting this wide scene. Then the camera shoots a little bit tighter. Then the camera goes in and starts doing close-ups, 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 right? Well, I don't need that because I've already got it from the wide angle. And if, I, if the main camera is doing a close-up here, and I'm perched right beside him, surely I'm gonna get into somebody's eye line. That's the biggest trick that there is, I think, in being a successful set photographer, is knowing when to push it, when you're gonna get into an eye line and how to avoid that. By getting your close-ups on the master, you avoid eye line issues. I'll, I'll tell you a story about uh, a couple of actors that I worked with. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton, in, in Fargo and uh, um, uh, Marty Free, uh, Freeman in Fargo. When I met Martin the first time, uh, I introduced myself and said, uh, how do you feel about me shooting during takes? And he says, absolutely not. He says, I will give you rehearsals in perfect character. I will do any setup you want at any time. I will recreate the scene at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the take for you, but you can't shoot during the takes, because I distracted so easily. I said, fair enough. And he was good to his word. He was just a sweetheart to shoot. Billy Bob Thornton. I was really nervous about Billy Bob Thornton. As some of you know, he's got a bit of a reputation as a wild child. I introduced myself and I says, uh, how do you feel about me shooting during takes? He takes a step back. 
And he says, you want to photograph me while I'm acting? And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to end well. And I said, well, that's sort of the idea. And he shakes his head and says, I've got to, I've got to be clear about this. While I'm in the middle of my craft, my profession, my acting, you want to take pictures of me? And I said, yeah. He says, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm an actor. I can act like you're not there. And he turned out to be the greatest guy ever. I, I would walk across glass to shoot him again. He was so much fun, such a pro. He gave me some incredible setups. I'll show you uh, if I can find it here. Uh, there. One of my favorite shots that, yeah. That was in the car in the studio. He was getting ready for a, a, a green screen setup where he's driving. He's, he sees me, look, he looks out the window and he sees me standing there with my camera and he just gives me a nod and, and then gives me that look. And it, it took five seconds to shoot. And I thought, boy, when I saw it afterwards, because you know it's Billy Bob, but he's not recognizable as Billy Bob because of his hair and everything else. And I, I just, something about the drama of that shot, I just loved. And sure enough, the studio loved it too and, and, and it was used heavily in, in marketing. Um, when I introduce myself to the actors, I, I, I tell them, I say, you know, I'm going to try to shoot what I can on the masters. I may ask for, for close-ups or I may ask for things here and there and so on. And I, are you good with that? And most of them understand that. And I also tell, tell the actor, I says, I look at every single frame I shoot before it goes to the studio. If there's anything that makes you look bad or me look stupid, it's never going to see the, end, uh, the, the light of day. The studio won't even get a chance to consider using it because it's, and that's a deal breaker for me. I've had studios want me to turn my card in at the end of the day and I won't do it. I want to look at the stuff first and that's, that gains trust with your actors. They, they know that you, you got their best interest in mind. I'll tell you another story about an a actress that I worked with and I won't n mention her name, we'll just call her KB. It's in uh, Vancouver Island. I get on set the first day, Monday morning, bright and early. The producer looks at me and says, how come you're here? And I says, well, because it's the first day of shooting. He says, didn't the studio talk to you on the weekend? No. KB doesn't want you shooting on the first day of set. KB wants to see your portfolio. KB wants to interview you. Well, I says, well, my portfolio, that's easy. It's online. Uh, KB doesn't like online. She wants to see your book. In the old days, we all had these leather binders with full of eight by tens showing our work, and that's what would go to the studio. Well, KB wanted to see my book. I didn't have one. I'm, I'm on the clock. I fly back to Calgary, go through a bunch of photos that I had of women that were over 40 that I, that I photographed, Angelina Jolie, um, a few others like that, made a book, flew back the next day, and she's, uh, the book went to Kim, uh, KB. And anyway, went, went to this person. Uh, she said, okay, I, I like his portfolio, um, but I need to interview him. So I went in to her trailer at lunch for the interview. And, sh and she said, okay, here's the rules. You can't shoot me during rehearsals because I'm not in full character. I said, okay. You can't shoot me in the, during takes because it could be distracting. I'm thinking, oh, another one. This isn't going to end well. I will do setups if I think it's important enough. But that's all I'll do. Well, what this person, KB, thought was important isn't necessarily what the studio thought was important and vice versa. So I said, fine. So out comes the 300 mil lens and I'm hiding, <laughs> literally hiding, um, w however I, I could find it. I would get two Teamsters to stand there and say, just stand right there, face me, and then I would poke the lens in between them and, and shoot. And this producer says, you know you're fired if she catches you. And I says, yeah, that's fine. That's the only way I'm going to get what I need. And he says, okay. So we're, one scene that, that was really challenging is there's a parade down the main street of this small town. And I had to get shots of her during the parade waving to everybody or whatever she was doing. Mm -hmm. and the, there's all these cars lined up along the parade route. They were all our cars. Uh, set dressing, you know. Uh, I went to the Teamsters and I said, listen, 
will you roll down all the windows in all those cars along the parade route? And he says, why, why would I do that? And I said, because you're going to get a couple of cases of beer. Fine. Yeah. All the windows get rolled down. So the parade's going along. I'm tracking with the parade on the other side of the cars, shooting through the open windows. I'm, I'm, and I've got really good stuff and she never saw it. I'm setting up cameras, planning them here, and then walking away and remote firing. Got away with that. <clears throat> two, two or three days before the end of the movie, she says, uh, I want to review his work. And I'm thinking, oh boy. So we start going through um, digital contact sheets. And the first thing she says is, I don't remember doing a setup on that. I said, yeah, that was that really cloudy day, remember? We thought it was going to rain and we just... And I was making this up. And she says, oh yeah, now I remember. And I had to go through that with a whole bunch of these shots. Some were setups, but some were just... I just had to lie. But she, she liked the stuff. The gallery photographer, and I'll get into gallery in a minute. The gallery photographer was coming in the next day to do her formal advertising. The gallery is the big bucks uh, photo for the poster that's set up and, and, and so on. <clears throat> she says, well, I don't want him to shoot it. I, I've seen Chris's work. He'll do it. So that means this photographer that was already booked now just made $10,000 for not coming. Me, I've got a whole new set of pressure to, to do a gallery with her, and not for his rate either, of course. Um, but that's, that's somehow, sometimes how the actors are, you know. Uh, see, I've, I've gone off about three different pages of, of uh, stuff here. Chris? Yes? When you talk about masters, what does that mean, the shooting master? Oh, a master? Um, the master is, the, is the, the big wide shot that sets the scene. So the, the master here, of, let's say the scene is me doing a talk with you guys. So there'd be a master from here, maybe over my shoulder or, or of everything else, right? And then close-ups this way. And then we would turn around and the camera would be back there shooting over top of you on me. So that's the master shot as opposed to medium close-ups or tight close-ups. Does that make sense? Um, don't talk to the actors unless you know them really well, all right? Be in the background. Once, you know, if you're on a long series, you, you get to know the actors really well, or if you've worked with them multiple times. And, and I hate name dropping, uh, but uh, Kevin Costner is a prime example. The first time I worked with him, I was scared, you know, because he was such a big guy. And he turned out, nobody can be in his eye line. I mean, he's just fanatical, except, except he'd allow me in, uh, which was kind of, a, kind of nice. Um, the best comment I've ever had from an actor or a director or a producer, and it came from Kevin uh, one time, is, you know, Chris, you should have been here yesterday. We did some really cool stuff. And, and I said, yeah, I know you did. I was here. That's how low key you gotta be. My wife is concerned because my entire wardrobe, except for this jacket, is black. I've got another story. I'm on, again, with Kevin. We're in Romania. Uh, doing Hatfields and McCoys, which was three and a half months in Romania. Fantastic experience. Uh, and I was Kevin's photographer. He brought me in for that one. Um, they had a, uh, a Romanian girl, uh, 25 years old. She looked like a model. Gorgeous. And she was doing behind the scenes video. And the producers asked me if I could just sort of help her with positioning and so on and, and give her a few tips. So I said, sure. About a week into the show, the producers come to me and says, you've got to tell her that she can't dress the way she dresses. She's distracting the actors because she would wear these bright outfits. You know, nothing sleazy or low cut or anything, but just bright and colorful. And, and if, she, if she can't do that, then we're going to have to find a new shooter. So I sent her home. I, said, I, I told her, I says, go home, find everything that you need to wear, but it has to be black. Go out and buy it if you have to. She did. She came back the next day, head to toe in black, and she never had an issue. And that's something that you've got to be aware of. Moving during this, the scene. For some reason, the dolly can move, the boom man can move, but if the set photographer is moving, he's a distraction. <laughs> Go figure that out. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, uh, I haven't got that one figured. 
know the people in the, in the departments. Know who your key grip is, your gaffer, which is the head electrician. Don't ask an electric for a ladder because the ladders are property of the grips. There's a photographer that I know that asked for a six foot ladder. The key grip was leaning on the ladder and says, well, I'm sorry, we don't have one. Uh, and I might need this one. Because this photographer was forever taking equipment, borrowing equipment, ladders on his own and not putting it back. Or even an apple box, which is a wooden box like this called a full apple. And that irked the department. So don't take anything without asking. When, when they give it to you, offer to put it back yourself. Nine times out of 10, they'll say, no, we'll take care of it, but make that offer. I've never had uh, an electric or a grip or hair or makeup or anybody refuse a request that I've made. That's really, really important. And that's part of the, part of the, the pecking order. You know, we are the first ones to be kicked out of a, out of a tight set. You know, we're the first ones that are in somebody's eye line. They can have, again, they can have all these people moving, but they get picked on by us. I'm going to tell you another story here. Let me find what I'm looking for. Whoops. Jack Palance, before... Your, a lot of you guys' time, you don't know. If, if you don't know who he is, he's worth looking up. He was in the John Wayne category, a uh, uh, Western tough guy, action guy. One of my first features that I ever did was with, with Jack. First scene of the day, I get kicked off set by Jack. So I'm, I'm done. Second day I come, second scene of the day, I get kicked off set by Jack. Third day, I get kicked off by set. Three times a charm. I went to the producers, producers and said, you know what, uh, obviously there's some bad chemistry here or something. I'm, I'm quitting. You better find somebody else. So I go home. This is pre-cell phone days. By the time I get home, there's a message on my answering machine, and it's Jack. He's apologizing. He says, I'm having problems with the script. They're making last-minute changes. You were a really convenient target. I'm sorry. <laughs> Would you like to come back? And I thought, Phew, sure. So I went back the next day, and Jack and I had a, a little ta talk, got things worked out, and he turned it to be a sweetheart, and got everything I needed. Now, this particular shot, this was the gallery, and I've mentioned gallery before a couple times. This is the, this, and this is the first big gallery I've ever done. And it's one, sometimes your gallery, you know, you, it's on seamless. You have the actors looking in all sorts of different directions because you know it's going to be a composite. Uh, this one had been approved, it was a, a, a drawing that, that I was given, saying this is what we want the, the, the shot to look like. He's gonna be holding this gold, his gun is gonna be there, and he's gonna be, have a cigar, so it was all set up. So I'm in the studio with Jack, three, my three assistants, this was in film days, shooting medium format. We've got hair, makeup, wardrobe, we've got producers, we've got, um, his agent, we've got the head of the photo department from the studio, her three assistants. We probably got 30 people in the studio. We've got this massive buffet lined up. I'm, I'm all lit, I'm, I'm pre-lit before Jack even arrives. He's seen the, the, the picture that we're gonna do and he's approved of it. He sits down and he starts looking around at all these people and says, Chris, do we really need a room full of a-holes here like this? And I said, fine with him. I don't need them. And he, and he says, out, everybody, get out. And my assistants look at me and I just, so now it's just me and Jack. Nobody else goes into the pose. I shoot a roll, change, change backs, do another roll, do three rolls of film. And I said, Jack, I think we've got it. And he says, Chris, the fourth shot is the one. First roll, fourth shot. We're done. And I says, good, I'll let them know. And he says, nope, nope. I'm going to make a point here with some of these people. I said, no, let's have some, something to eat and have coffee. I sat with Jack for an hour, listening to him tell me stories about the old days in Hollywood. And I wish I could have recorded it. It was just, it was marvelous. 
And he looks at his watch and says, an hour, I think we've made our point. You can, you can tell them that we're done. <laughs> so, uh, and this is, this is the shot. And I think it turned out pretty good for a for first time gallery. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Is that the picture he, he referred to? No, that's, that's the photo, the, there was an, the art department did a drawing uh, of him, uh, you know, in that pose. Yeah. As, and and says this and Jack had approved it, so this is first little fourth shot. For, yeah, yeah. He 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 knew. Okay, now I've jumped around. Oh, here's the, here's an interesting quote: "The importance of still photography in film cannot be overstated. Many times, it's the first image the audience sees. It must capture the audience's attention, and it must also represent the tone and the character of the story." We're telling. Sounds simple, right? It's not. That quote, Tom Cruise. I've never worked with uh, with him, but he's the, he's the the dream guy for a photographer if if he's got an attitude like that. The first look is really important because, as he says, that's the first time they they see something from the movie, and and you're a storyteller. You're you're telling them something. So this is the first look. This is one of Jack. This is uh, Bridget Fonda. And this is, again, his first look. This is a gallery. Uh, on a magazine cover. Uh, one of the posters for Miracle. An advertisement for Helen Wills with the actor out of character. Eight Blow with Paul Walker, first look. And the idea is that is that when you look at that picture, for example, you, you know it's Paul Walker, and he's got a whole whack of dogs with him, so what's the story? It's asking you a question. And that's why first look is so important. Okay, types of photography. How am I doing on time here? Well, we're okay, I guess. <laughs> Good. We've talked about the day-to-day -day photography. That's the unit photography. It's called the unit photography, and it can be on a feature, by contract, it's every day. Television, it's, it can vary uh, one or two days a week uh, or, or every day on, on a big TV series. Unit setups, as I talked about, where you pull the actor aside and you, you go to them. And again, I'm going I'm to go back to um, Kevin Costner. We're on set, and I, I don't carry a radio. I'm close to somebody, and I hear uh, Casey, Kevin Costner. Casey is looking for large. Anybody see him? I thought, oh, geez, I got into Zyline or something. What did I do? So I went and saw him. I said, you were looking for me, Kevin? He says, yeah, look at this light. I've, I've got half an hour on this lighting setup. And look at this natural light we've got. Let's, let's do some shooting. That would happen with Kevin usually once a week. He would see something that he liked. And he would, instead of me going to him, he'd come to search me out and say, OK, let's, let's do some setups here, because this is really good. He had, he had a great eye for photography. Uh, and there's a few other actors like that, and those are the actors that you love to work with because they totally get it, they understand, you know, and they don't mind. On a big, on a big turnaround, like so, we've gone from the, this to the reverse on it, so that's a turnaround. You've got half an hour while they relight it. So if you've got an actor that's willing to 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 give you two minutes of their time or five minutes of their time, uh, you know, you, you knock yourself out. Uh, you get great art that way. So that's the unit setups. You're also required sometimes to do stuff for the art department. I don't know how many crime scene shots I've done for movies over the years, you know, with the body outlined in chalk and markers, uh, because it's going to be in a newspaper story that plays on, on set. Gallery, which I've talked about, is formal advertising photography, usually done on seamless, uh, unless you've got a, a um, like this, this eight below. Again, this was a concept shot that we knew exactly what we wanted to do. Um, uh, before, so it was it was not on it was on seamless, but it was posed a very specific way. A lot of times they don't know how they're going to market the show until afterwards, so you get this all this thing. Um, whoops, let me find it here. Oh, there it is. Well, this is my first big gallery shot. This is open range again with Kevin Costner. I've been fortunate. I've done two shows with with Kevin, and I've. Unfortunately, I had to turn down three more because I was already booked. 
Kevin's very, very loyal to his crew. He likes to keep the same people around. He, he came to me and in the morning and said, oh, by the way, Chris, the studio is coming. Uh, art, the art department director and the creative director from the studio is coming today to talk to us about the gallery. And I, I was kind of flabbergasted that he'd be talking to me about gallery because, uh, you know, they bring in big time shooters a lot of times or sometimes. We sat down at lunch with the studio people and literally on scrap paper drew out this concept and we wanted to, to sort of get the feeling of the shootout at the OK Corral. So we've got Kevin up high in, in the barn looking down on the street as our bad guys are coming down the street, you know, and, and a dramatic sky. And that was three, three or four composite shots that I did, uh, all medium format to, to, to get that. And it doesn't come out in this particular copy so much, but we put a little extra light uh, in on the gun and, and the, the ammo so that yeah. your eye came to that. And uh, posed it very, very carefully and, and shot it. So that's one type of, of gallery. Now, gallery is for advertising as opposed to publicity, so there's usually a buyout on gallery work. And that buyout can be $1,000, it can be $5,000, uh, or in the really big picture of things, I know gallery shooters, that their buyout is $50,000, which is pretty good for a day's work. Plus, all, all the equipment rentals and your crew and everything else, that's all, that's, that 50,000 is just the buyout. That's uh, fairly rare. Um, yep. Yes. Yeah, unit work is work for hire, which means they own the image. I can't, I, and that's one of the reasons that I'm using only my work on this is I, I could show you lots of really great first looks, but I don't want to get into any, uh, any usage problems um, because I'm being paid for this, so it becomes commercial usage. So that's why I'm using my own work. Not that it's the best. There's other unit work that is far better than mine, but you know I have the rights to use this for my own use. Um, now you got me completely sidetracked. Okay, um, we'll get into a couple more things before we hit the big question, and that's the union. Um, my kit, now I'm, I shoot Sony, uh, which is fine. I have two basic Pelicans that I carry. This one is my on-set Pelican. Two bodies with two zooms mounted, uh, and then some primes. If, if I'm not using the primes, uh, because I don't use them very often. They go into my other, other uh, truck Pelican case and my RX fits in that spot. So this is backup cameras, all stuff for mounting. I do a lot of remote mounts with, with cameras, uh, but that just lives on the truck. Uh, I carry a cold weather, cold weather slash rain bag, uh, which stays on the truck. Um, extra rain gear, fleece, dry socks, uh, and really, really important, indoor shoes. There's nothing worse than having to put on booties when you're doing interior shots every time. You put on those blue booties. So if you have a dedicated pair of indoor shoes, I always have that in my bag. Uh, <coughs> you have, uh, I shoot with 10 CF cards. Um, uh, and um, so that I, two per body per day, so I have a five-day uh, supply of them. And I never format any cards uh, until the, I'm actually going to shoot them. I leave them actually the way they are, so that gives me an extra five days of backup. I back up all my files to a couple of, of uh, hard drives um, and usually upload to the studio server every night. My workflow is I ingest to this computer here, which is a 16-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 processor. Uh, I ingest using the program that you see running in the background, which is Photo Mechanic, which is by far the fastest way to ingest the cards. It's not an editing program. It's just for ingesting, sorting, renumbering them. Um, you, can, you can see in... in uh, not, for example, see there's a little red box on the bottom of that. When you're going through them, I can mark mark them, 
and color code them and then just be able to look at that color code by itself. So my deletes are all one color, my scenics are one color, so I can go back and review them uh, easily without having to go through the entire card again. Um, I tether to um, a laptop um, for gallery work uh, and that gives me the opportunity to see what I'm, I'm doing on a bigger screen. I also have a 24 inch monitor that I set up for, for everybody else to look at, hair and makeup and the producers and so on. Um, I use uh, the Sony native um, program, but um, there's a number of them that uh, gallery and, and uh, Lightroom and stuff you can tether. And tethering is a really good, good way to do it. And now I shot, I shot stuff during the pandemic where the, everybody was, was zoomed on it. So I could zoom what I was doing. So they were seeing what I was shooting in real time. So the art director in Toronto or LA could say, you know what? Let's let's move a little bit to the left, or let's center it more, or let's increase the top light, you know, something like that. Okay, now we get to, I know what some of you is the big question of the day, and that's the union. ICG, or IATSE 669, the International Cinematographers Guild, which I'm a member of. The union on any show over probably a million dollars, let's say, budget goes union in Alberta. Um, there's independence that, that happens. Some of those are decent size. Um, but even those, a lot of them are, are going to the low, uh, low budget agreement with the union. It represents directors of photography, operators, first camera assistants, stills photographers, uh, drone pilots, so on, any, anything that way. Another union, still IATSE, uh, works with all the other departments, grips, electric, sound, hair, makeup, wardrobe. Uh, why the union? Number one, the rates. The, even on a low budget, it's $66 an hour, overtime after eight, and, and more overtime after 12. Uh, feature rate is $77 an hour, that, and that's scale. That doesn't mean you have to work for that, but that's the minimum that they can pay you. Um, there's, besides the rates, there's pension fund, there's really good health care, uh, there's uh, first aid requirements, um, and overall safety. The union has the power to shut the set down if, if, if the steward feels that it's unsafe. And I've been on shows where it has been shut down. I've been on shows where it's the steward has decided that it's too cold to shoot. And Fargo comes to mind, we shut the show down one day. We, we had to because it just was not safe. Um, now. For those of you making notes, anybody that wants this detailed information, all they have to do is fire me an email, and I will send you this, this whole package that I put together. Okay? And my email is pretty simple. Coincidentally, it's chrislarge at macmac.com. All I have to do is fire me an email, and I will send this whole package out to you as a PDF. Now, <coughs> the category. I'm going to just read this from the union website. The responsibilities of a unit stills photographer are primarily marketing, advertising, archiving, and asset creation in support of the art department. Marketing and advertising means capturing on-camera action and performances, behind-the-scene moments, and interesting vignettes, uh, which give, typically give the public the first look at a, at a forthcoming motion picture television. Uh, it goes on, uh, being a unit still photographer necessitates that one be a good General photographer with strong understanding of photojournalism, portrait photography, and cinematic style. Uh, it <laughs> crucially, it can also require that one operates stethil st stethily, which I give you an example of hiding behind people. That's one part of it. Now, here's where we get into the real nitty gritty. The requirements. Applicants are expected to be established professional photographers with published work that has been purchased by professional photo editors. Application should, the application should reflect professional standards in photography, business practice, and ethics. You're expected to own uh, a minimum of two mirrorless cameras with zoom lenses and primes. Uh, lighting you have to know about. Your, your website has to be uh, accepted as your portfolio. Uh, it needs studio work, it needs unit work, it needs behind the scenes. 
uh, crime scenes, car chases, all this. This goes on for two pages of the requirements. And as some of you know, it's really tough to get in, really tough. It took me five years. It's taken other members longer. Uh, I know that last year, um, in all of uh, the jurisdiction of 669, which is BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, we let in two. And I'm not part of that process of letting, when I say we, the union let in two, both in Vancouver. Um, it's, it is tough. And why, why, is it, why is it tough? I get asked that a lot. We force the productions to use a union photographer. They can't just bring in their, their brother who does weddings. They have to use a union photographer. We're the only category in the movies that doesn't have a trainee program, and it's frustrating. Grips have a trainee program where you come in, you don't know anything about gripping, but you come in, you're paid, not, not really great, but you are getting paid for it, but you're learning from the five other grips, and you're tested, and you can move up in the grip department. The camera department, we have a camera trainee. I'm part of the camera department. We have a camera trainee that comes in and does all the heavy lifting and cleaning and sweeping the floors and moving stuff and learning. And why that is, is, is the producers like to say that it's to, to, to benefit the industry. Well, it does benefit the industry, but it benefits the producers because they're getting an extra body for a much, much lower price. Stills is a one-man department. One man. There is no heavy lifting in comparison to electrics or grips. There isn't the need for three or four people like there is in makeup. There's one person. So it's hard to justify the producers putting another $30 an hour on a, to a person who really isn't doing anything to aid the production. And the union has a hard time for the union to spend $30 an hour out of union funds to do that. We, as the local, as the stills photographer part of the union, we've got a committee that are trying to figure out a way around that, trying to figure out something we can do, and it, it hasn't been easy. Um, you know, the producers certainly aren't going to pay for it, and we don't know how the union would pay for it, too. It would be a lot of money. But we're looking for mentorships or some, some, some way we can do it. Um, all the requirements are on that handout that, that I'll tell you. A unit photographer has no guidance on set. You're there by yourself. You're getting very little feedback um, from anybody, especially when you get to, a, maybe on an independent or a really small show, you know, you might have the operator giving some, some guidance or the DOP or something. But on a show I do, I've got nobody looking at my work until a couple days later. And even then, it's, you know, there's, there's no, oh, you need more of this, you need more than that. You're expected to know what you need. Um, I give out samples of my work to, to the grown-ups, to the producers and to the studio. Uh, usually in the first week or so, I'll, I'll send them some selects uh, just to look at with a big big disclaimer on it, that they're not color corrected, they're not approved by actors. Actors have approval of the, of the photos that are used. 50% approval or 30% or 100% on some actors. So I made it very clear. But this gives, the, the, again, the producers and so on, gives them a little bit of a guide uh, to what you're doing, what, what you're getting. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is your portfolio. If you're serious about getting into the business, your portfolio is about movies and TV. It's not about weddings. It's not about rodeo. Uh, it's not about car, car chases. Uh, it's not, you know, um, any of that stuff. It is about the unit photography or gallery photography. Uh, and you can have two websites, one general website, but all the other stuff you do. But if you, if you want someone at a studio to look at your website, then it has to be really focused towards that. Um, nobody carries a, a, a print uh, portfolio now. I, it's, I haven't been asked for one in 10 years since that one in the incident that I told you about. Um, let me just see if I missed anything. You know, just to sum things up, because I think I, I am running a little bit late. Um, your photography is probably one-third of the equation. The other two-thirds 
are about how you act on set, how you get along with people. People skills it can't be over, overstated. The, the people skills are what's going to get you the work, what's going to get you the cooperation from the actors. You're all good photographers, you know. Uh, I, I think all of you, if you took the time to come here, you're already pro probably good photographers. You know about composition, you know about lighting and so on. It's, it's, the, it's the set experience that is, is going to give you, the, give you the job. It's the set experience that's going to get the grips to go that extra step to give you, give you the ladder. It's, it's going to get you the actor to give you 30 seconds, but you're only going to use 15. It's been really good for me. Uh, I've got no complaints. It's been a good, good career, my third career. Um, and as long as I'm enjoying it, I'm going to keep doing it. I've been all over the world. Uh, I've, I've shot in some really exotic locations. I've worked with some really, really big actors, some really great crews. Uh, and... Um, if you can get there, it's, it's a good gig to have. I uh, want to thank you for coming out, taking time out of your Sunday or Saturday mornings to come and listen to me uh, ramble on. Um, I will answer any questions you want, and if you want the, the whole package, email me. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Chris. All right, who's got a question right off the bat? Oh, geez. <laughs> Ladies first, Neil. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, my most favorite part of the job and least favorite part. My most, my most favorite is locations. I mean, I've, I've been in Fiji, I've been in Mexico a number of times, I've been in Romania, uh, I've been in the Arctic, I've been um, uh, uh, all over the place. And the locations and the people that you meet. Like Romania was a great example because we're on a five day week, uh, decent hours, we had the weekends to explore uh, and hang out with the locals because most of the crew was local. And, and it was yes. great fun. The, my least favorite is if you've, got a, if you've got good actors, it's the greatest job in the world. If you've got a bad actor, what I mean is an uncooperative actor, that can be miserable because you're still expected to get the work. But I've had a few actors tell me I don't want to be photographed. Okay, well, that makes the job tough. You either go about it like I did with that one person, you know, or you just ignore them. And, and, uh, uh, risk getting fired. Hmm. All right. Sorry, Neil. Steve. Question Steve. <laughs> question regarding the blimps. Yes. So, so, how heavy were they? And shooting the film in that kind of uh, the setting where you have no access to the controls other than the shutter trigger. Um, the 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 blimp doubled the weight of your camera. Um, and. And you had two. Yeah, because you so you had two lenses, so I'd have a, a 50 on one and a and a uh, 85 on the other or, or whatever, and you've got auto focus. In later on, you know, we had auto focus, um, but you had no other controls that you, you could get at, uh, and uh, they were just really annoying. I, I don't, I I have a picture of one, but it's not easily to get at. But if you if you look. Just Google uh, camera blimps. And We've had a couple come through here on consignment, and you think it's a lens like this big, but the blimp itself is this foam padded case yeah, yeah, yeah. that's this big. It looks like an underwater house. Right? Yeah. And so they're incredibly awkward to work with. Yeah. Right? So kudos to you guys for in the past working oh, with those. Yes. yes. Um, do you receive scripts in advance or do you get sides the night prior or the day Oh, or uh, both. I get a, I'll, get a, I'll get a script before I accept a show. Um, and then, so and do you know then, the ending of the show? Yeah, <laughs> usually. Um, so I'll get a script and a crew list and a cast list, and I'll research what I what I need to do. And then every day, you get a call sheet for what's coming up. Like in the evening, you'll get a call sheet for the next day, and 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 sides the, the actual script sides that, that's going to go on. And and you make one of the things I like about my job is that I'm not necessarily there the entire day. That that if this if the first shot of the day is two people having breakfast and, the, and we're talking about a big action movie and, and it's, it's some scene where they're having breakfast, well, I really don't need that. Now, and, and I've got the experience that I can, I can make that decision. If you're new, you're there for everything. Um, but yeah, you'll get sides and, and then a rundown of what maybe the next two days might be. But it, it changes at the last minute. Yes? You mentioned 
Oh, yeah. That there was a lack of training program. Yeah. And as someone that wants to get into the program, I'm currently in the camera, like the cinematographer's training program. What do you kind of recommend as be the, the pathway to get into this role without well, that program that's the, specific the, for stills? Well, two, two ways. Get yourself on set however you can. As an actor and uh, as a, a, a PA, get into a training program with, with the grips or the lecture, any, any place that's going to get you physically on set so you can watch what you're doing. My word of advice is if you get into the trainee program, uh, any trainee program, the last thing you want to do is say, well, I'm, I'm doing this to get set experience so I can be a set photographer. <coughs> the, the, worst, the worst thing that happens with, with our department, camera department, the trainee shows up and says, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really a, a, a DOP. I'm re really a director of photography, and I've done a lot of that stuff, but I, I have to do this. You know, don't do that. Be, be a PA. It's the worst job there is. You're first in, last out. You're cleaning the tables. You're emptying the garbage, but you're on set. You, you, you can see what's going on. You can get a feel for the set. And that, that set experience is, is what's really, really critical. That's cool. I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, do you have, like, a, a, your dream set of gear? What is your... Like, mirrorless has obviously changed your business drastically, yeah. right? But have you found a, a piece of kit you can't live without, like your go-to? Um, well, I'm a Sony guy, obviously, uh, and nothing has happened with the other... Nikon have come out with some great cameras now. Canon come, has come out with some great cameras. But there's been nothing that's been significant uh, enough to me to change my learning curve because I'm really comfortable with the Sony's and they give me they give me great images. There's nothing wrong with them and the other cameras. Um, the one piece of gear that that is surprisingly uh, useful is, and I don't I, I can't show you it, but it's it's a uh, a French flag. And what that is is a way to flag your lens from from the, usually from the sun. And the cinematographers have them, and they'll clip on. I found one at London Drugs years ago, and it's it's um, it's actually a sort of a fabric, and it velcros on, and you can, and, it's, and you can bend it around and attach it right around the front of your lens, and and uh, you can adjust the angle to uh, protect you when you're shooting in, into the sun. Because some cinematographers really like everything to be backlit, so that means you're constantly shooting into the sun. Hmm. And you can, you know, you can use your hand or a, a flag or anything else, card piece of cardboard to flag the sun. But having that one that attaches right to your lens is really, really handy. Okay. Now, talking earlier with you, I was actually a little surprised. You run Sony A9s. Right? Yeah, A9 Mark IIs. Right? Yeah. And uh, I was a little surprised because we have much higher resolution cameras on the market. Yeah. I thought you'd be using the highest resolution you possibly could for all the shots. Yeah, which would mean I'd be going to the A1. But for what unit photography needs, uh, they don't need 50 megapixels. And some studios don't want it because it slows the work process mm -hmm. down. And you have to upload every night. And I'm, sh I'm shooting... I'm shooting on a busy day with a lot of action. I'm shooting 2,000 frames. And I'm looking at, at every one of those frames that night in the hotel or at home or wherever and making the decision what to cut down. And I'll cut that 2,000 down to 200. But uploading every night to 200 full res raw is a lot of work. And the studios, it bogs them down. And if, if I need high, high resolution for gallery, which they want as big as you can get, then I shoot the uh, uh, A7R, and you know, which is what is that now? 60, 60, 60 yeah. megapixels. Which, which, and it used to be me medium format, digital or film medium format, and then digital medium format. But I've since I've I've been doing uh, with the R now for five years. I've never had anybody say you know we need more resolution. So you use Sony oh, for, for camera gear stuff. What about like studio like flashes or hot I've lights? I've got an assortment. The, the, uh, I've got eight different heads. <coughs> I've got. You travel with them all? No, okay. only for gallery. <laughs> or uh, and if I'm doing gallery, I'll usually rent if, if I'm in Vancouver. Um, <coughs> Alien bees are the great bang for the buck, and I've got men, uh, men for auto support equipment. I've got a couple of other heads that I use. It's a real mix mismatch. Yeah. Do you shoot in burst mode or single frames? Burst mode. <coughs> I, <coughs> and that's sometimes why I shoot 2,000 frames, is because I want that moment of the, these four people that I'm shooting where all their eyes are open at the same time. Because on that four shot, if one of them has got their eyes closed, that shot's no good. 
So I'll, I'll shoot uh, with the Sony's. I usually shoot low rate, which is I think 10 or 12 frames a second, which is enough. I shoot most of my stuff is continuous focus, and to use the the on, on the zoom lenses, there's the there's the auxiliary button to lock your focus. Um, so continuous burst raw, and I shoot because uh, all my cameras are two slot cameras. I shoot raw in in the A slot, and I shoot JPEG in in the other slot slot and the JPEG is the backup and the reason that I don't shoot both raw is just it slows it slows the buffer down too much. An interesting question, couple of questions going on online here yep. is we switched to uh, mirrorless cameras we have electronic shutter but have you had trouble with banding or any issues as far as the, the yeah, studio lighting goes? Yeah I mentioned at the start yeah banding was an issue and, and banding is caused by by, uh, by a, a band of, of off color coming across the screen and, and it's a rolling shutter and if your exposure time was at a certain rate, combined with a certain aperture, you'd get this horrible banding. And and really, the cheaper the lights lights that are being used, the more prevalent it is. On bigger shows now, you know they're using um, really really good uh, lighting equipment and banding. I can't remember the last time that I had any banding issue with with the A9s, and I think the the. Sony's and the Nikon's now, their new models are pretty much immune to it. Just, and you, you can get rid of it usually by changing your shutter speed and just experimenting. And that's why when I, not so much now, but I used to, when I'd walk into a set, I'd, even before the actors were there, once it's sort of lit, I'd just do three or four frames a burst so I could look at it and see if it's banding. Because sometimes it'll be there, but you don't notice it in a single frame. You know, if it's a busy background, you may not even notice the banding. Right. Any question? Obviously, with uh, with videography, cinematography, they're rolling at a much lower shutter speed than you might be for set stills. Um, yeah. Obviously, in low light, if you're working with whatever they have set up on set for a one sixtieth of a second, how are uh, are you just are you like just boosting your ISO? Yeah, um, that's that's a great question because action stuff in low light is really tough. Uh, because you've got to have a high enough shutter speed that you're going to freeze the action. You know, if, if, if they're, guys are having a knife fight in, in a darkened room, well, you're still going to have to need a, a 250 or a 500 to, to freeze the action. So that's why I carry the, the primes, because they're all 1.4 or 1.8, so I can get a couple extra stops that way. And I'm not afraid to shoot at 10,000 ISO. Uh, I'm not afraid to shoot, if I, if I had to, I'll shoot at 20,000 ISO. The noise reduction software out there now is, is good enough to make 20,000 ISO usable if it's there to start with. Now, and, I, and again, I can't speak for the other brands because I don't use them. Uh, from what I've heard, they've they're all got good uh, you know, uh, capabilities at high ISOs. I just know for my experience that, that I try not to shoot at 20,000, but I don't hesitate to shoot at 10,000 ISO. You know? And even if it looks grainy, you know, it's, it still cap captures the, the, the image. I mean, there's a, a picture here. Oh, the, yeah, that's the one I was looking for. That was shot with, with uh, low light, and when you look at it closely, it is, it is a little bit grainy. But you know what? I don't think it hurts it. One of the most interesting coffee table books is, and I, and I don't know the photographer, uh, but it's uh, Raging Bull, the, the, the movie Raging Bull. And the whole book is black and white, and it is grainy as hell. But so is the movie, and and the, and, the, and it works. So, don't be afraid of, of a little bit of noise because you can clean it up afterwards. Thank you. For composite photography, how how much creative control do you retain in kind of piecing all the pieces together afterwards? If you have a vision going in. Well, if we have no vision going in, then we have to allow for anything to happen. So, I'll do the lead actor, and and I will direct them. Okay. Eye line here, eye line there, eye line right here, right here, and I'll get a whole range of motion out of them. Um, you know, we may have hand props. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do, I'll do um, two or three hundred frames of one actor, just different variety. You know, I'll, I'll spend an hour with with the actor if if there's no no concept, and a lot of times there isn't is no concept. You know, I, I did I did a gallery where we had tw twelve people supposedly in one shot and there's no way physically that could happen because of timing and everything else 
So every one of them was done individually, but we didn't know who was going to be looking at who. And, you know, so, so how do you set up lighting if, you, if there's no concept before? Because the lighting sort of has to match between the models. Well, generally speaking, the, on, on gallery, the, the, the less dramatic the lighting, the better, because they can add it. Okay, it's heavily, heavily edited. Um, and once, once you put one side of the space in the shadow, you can't undo that in Photoshop. But if it's, you know, a, a flattering soft light, I did a lot of my gallery with three lights. And that's a big, big uh, softbox, oct octoboss box uh, above the camera, and two lights on, with umbrellas that are both giving me just a little bit of side fill and lighting the background up. And I've, I've done a lot of galleries with just three lights, you know. Uh, and they can add the drama afterwards. Okay. I, mean, I got a question. Yep. Have, uh, have you ever actually been starstruck yourself? I mean, you mentioned some big names here. Have you ever sort of been stopped in your tracks and like, wow, I can't believe I'm actually doing this? Um, I, got, I got called in. I was doing a movie uh, here in uh, Alberta. Um, and we were going and the last week of it, and it was all studio, and it was really incredibly boring. And I wasn't looking forward to it. <laughs> and I got a call out of the blue from the same studio, it was MGM at the time, saying, we've got a show going in Mexico right now, and we've got problems with the photography. Can you, you can get off the, because this is, you work for the studios, you don't work for the production company usually. So I was working for MGM. So I said, we'd like you to pull you from the show you're doing in Alberta, and, and day after tomorrow, we we'll, we'll want you in Mexico City. Um, to, to take over the show because we've got problems. And I said, well, yeah, uh, who's in it? Angelina Jolie and um, uh, Antonio Banderas. And uh, that caught me a little, Angelina caught me a little bit off guard. I, I wasn't starstruck, but I was, I was uh, thinking, um, you know, this is, uh, this is big time. It was, it was a show that, <laughs> that I had, was the biggest show that I had done at the time. And, and it was all in location in Mexico. We're in different parts of Mexico. Uh, got to, have I got time for a little yeah, story? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I got to know Antonio quite well. A great guy. He's, he's one of the nicest human beings in the world. And, and uh, we'd go for, for, uh, for dinner occasionally, and, and, uh, which doesn't happen very often. We're going to, we're going to the airport. Most of the crew had, had already left to, to our location, which was going to be on the uh, east coast of Mexico, a small little town. We got to the airport, and there's Antonio, uh, his manager and myself all at the checkout at the same time and we're just getting ready to check in and uh, and um, I, I says to Antonio okay I'll, I'll see you when you land and he says what are you talking about and he says well I'm, you're going first class and I'm a coach and Antonio just shakes, shakes his head and says no and then we get to the agent and, and he says to the, this girl there who is to he's a god in Mexico Antonio is, is <laughs> he's a god he says to the agent, he says, I, I'm not blaming you, ma'am. It, it was it's not your fault, but my photographer always travels with me. Um, what, what, what can we do? And he says, oh, Ms. Bandres, I'm so sorry. I'm, I, I'm so sorry. Of course he travels with you. And so I bumped me up to first class. And, you know, and, and, and Tony was so nice. We're, we're in the airport uh, going, going along um, one of the corridors, and these people wanting his autograph. And Antonio couldn't say no. And so I would let him sign a few, and then I would pretend like that I was more than just as a photographer. I said, Antonio, we're going to miss a flight. I'm sorry for people, you know, but I've got to take him away. So I'm the bad guy. They can get mad at me now. And, and Antonio loved that. You know, he, he, had, he had great laughs about that. But he was one of my favorites. And then I'm sort of the second last question is like, yep. what is sort of the, we've seen technology advancements, massive, right, yep. which have changed that industry. What other technology has really pushed that industry or pushed your side of things? Um, well, the biggest thing lately for me, other than, than the cameras, has been the, the new chip in the, in the Mac, <laughs> MacBooks. Uh, it's so much faster. Uh, I, I'm ingesting two or three times faster than I ever could before with, with the old ones. Um, that's been the biggest single thing for me. Cool. Ben. Uh, do you ever see this position being eliminated because of AI or um, other technologies that might come about? That, that's a great question. Um, I can I can see it, it being a challenge. Uh, I, I don't 
I don't think that we can ever be replaced. The, 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 the human reaction to something happening as it's, as it's going on. Uh, but I can see that, that it, it may change our work. Uh, and I don't know how it's going to, but you know, it, it's something that we've got to be aware of. But we've got that, that human part that I, I don't think is ever going ever gonna to change. Cool. All right. Any more questions here? We... Uh, you haven't talked about interactions with the lighting department. <laughs> I was going to actually ask, is there like a hierarchy with the on set? Like, are they just good enough that with their job that like there's no improvements? Or well, I, I certainly don't question the, the lighting. I mean, the, the director of photography and the gaffer, uh, they, set, they set it how they want the mood of the show to be. And I'm not going to ever say, well, geez, it's a little darker. I'm getting a bad shadow there. I, I work, <laughs> when I'm doing unit stuff, I work with what they've set. You can get... I, j I just had an experience fairly recently where the, the director, who is one of the producers of the show, didn't want me taking any photographs that weren't on the exact axis of, of a camera. They wanted me right beside a camera. I've never come across that before. And he's, his, he was saying that I want everything to be lit, everything that you shoot to be lit by the cinematographer. And he was saying that if I'm off axis or a different angle, that it's not going to be lit the same. Well, it isn't going to be lit the same, but that doesn't mean that it can't look really good and really dramatic. Nobody's going to be comparing a still frame to the motion picture and saying, well, you know, there's a, more of a shadow there or it's a little bit lower. And, and, that, and I, um, that became a, an issue that was strong enough to leave the show. Um, that, that we were doing out, outdoor stuff and it was lit by the sun. There was no auxiliary lighting. And he didn't like the fact that I wasn't on the same axis. And I'm 25 years of doing this, I've never run into that before. I couldn't do pull sides. He didn't want any pull sides being done with the actors. And sometimes a quick pull side is the best shot you're ever going to get. So, so yeah, no, whatever they do, that's that's their department. I, I don't, I don't make suggestions. I don't make observations um, with any department. You know, the one thing I'll do sometimes is very quietly. If I've noticed it in, through my camera that somebody's hair is is you know a little a little weird or they got a tag, I'll very quietly go to wardrobe or hair and just say you might want to just do a final checks because because the a label. But I would do that so low key, and it's because I know them too. Is there a certain tension like a certain like a protocol on set where you you know like you don't want to like ruffle feathers? You want to you know? Well, yeah. There's always there's always the the, the case that. That you're the only person there that isn't actively involved in the filmmaking, you know. Um, so there's boundaries that you don't cross, and and um, people that you know you don't get in their way, you don't slow them down. Like I mentioned, three, four, five hundred dollars a minute of production time. You know, the last thing you want is is the quote the costly stills delay, you know, and that's that's a, a, a an expression that's used. Oh, it's another costly sound delay as a joke. You know, because they're having problems with their mic or something, and they need an extra minute. And somebody will joke that it's the next. Well, I don't ever want to hear somebody say, another costly stills delay. You know, ask for 30, take 15. Cool. All right. Your full power to bring in your own light. It's just a little yes. thin light. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Now, if I'm doing a pull side, the, the, what I will do is, is from the grips, I, I'll, I'll never ask for a light, but from the grips, I'll get a, a bounce card and, and just fill a little bit of that. But that's for a pull side. It's got nothing to do with the scene. But yeah, that's, and I'm very careful about doing that. That's cool. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, yeah, one, one quick last question here. Uh, you mentioned you send like the raws to them. I'm sorry? You said, uh, you said you send the raws to them. Do you like post edit or like do any of that? Or is that oh, when, when I do, when I, when I do the, the, the peaks, the. It's like yeah. The yeah. Yeah, when I'm doing. For the first week, when I'm setting a few examples, I'll quickly run the raw through uh, Lightroom, and and I've got a couple of sort of normal processes that I use there, just so it looks better. Because a raw file by itself looks pretty crummy; it's pretty flat. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of post. I don't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, I tell them that it's been, you know, I have a standard signature on it that it's not not actor approved, not color corrected, uh, and cannot be released. You know, just to cover my own butt if some picture gets out there. 
That's perfect. All right, guys. Well, thanks for everybody joining us online and in the store here. I think there's a few donuts left over. <laughs> uh, and Chris, thank you so much for the insights into this very sort of niche business that uh, I think everybody's really interested in. So appreciate everybody joining us today, both in, in the store and online. Um, and you got more questions. Uh, Chris has got his email uh, he posted earlier. Yep. And uh, you're more than welcome to email me as well, Dave at the camera store .com. And we'll go from there. And hopefully we'll do this again soon. All right, guys.